Good morning, and welcome to worship here at CK Press. How is everybody today? I hope you're having an awesome day. Yeah, that's how I, I'm excited about church too. Um, well, we have some announcements for you this morning, and the first one is everyone's favorite announcement. The card in front of you, it is our super awesome connection card. It, you can fill it out if you want to get connected to uh, any of the staff or even to Sunday school. I know, you guys, it's always awesome. Or, but also, you can write down your prayer requests, what you have going on, maybe something that's weighing heavy on your heart or something you want to celebrate, God's blessings. We love play, praying every week for this congregation. So go ahead and fill those out and put them in the offering plate as it goes by. And um, coming up, s'mores and songs. I am so excited. This is one of my favorite things we do is when we have worship uh, services down at our fire pit. It's, if you've seen the gazebo down at the end of the parking lot, there's a trail, you just follow it down. We have this beautiful fire pit and cross. It's so special to be able to worship together outside. And there's also gonna be s'mores and childcare. So bring your kids, have some sweets, and let's worship God together. It's awesome. Um, coming up, the Rainier's outing. So I don't know if you guys love baseball, but I love a free hot dog. So sign up. Um, you sign up on the app, and that is coming up July 20th. It's going to be a great time together. And that's it. Awesome. Well, go ahead and stand, and I invite you to greet those around you, and welcome to everyone watching at home. We're glad you're here today.
Isaiah 44. High heavens sing. God has done it. Deep earth shout, and you mountains sing. A forest choir of oaks and pines and cedars. God has redeemed Jacob. God's glory is on display in Israel. Would you pray with me? Jesus, our Redeemer, to your name be all glory and honor and praise in all the earth. We welcome your presence with us as we worship in this place and as we go out into the world. Through your sacrifice and the grace of the Father, we are able to receive your spirit. We thank you and praise you forever. Amen.
all kids fifth grade and young, younger come on and join me up here <clears throat> come on take a seat hey good to see you Reuben come on come on welcome welcome hey Ruth hey Hannah hey Rowan hey we got a good crew good to see everybody so does anyone remember what we've been talking about in Sunday school Hannah that remembers uh, courage and, and faith yes faith yeah and church. We've been talking about church, too. Yes. Faith is uh, trusting in what you can't see based on what you can see. Um, and we are going to talk this week in Sunday school about um, trusting. You can trust God even when you feel stuck. Has anyone ever felt stuck before? Yeah, Ruth. What, what, how did you feel stuck? Oh, yeah. Oh, that is... I know. Being in a dark room, like, oh, claustrophobic. And yeah, yeah, that's a great one. I have one that I, I wonder if you guys can relate to. Being, do you ever feel, like, stuck in school? Ever? <laughs> like, especially after lunch, and, like, you're just feeling sleepy, and the time is just dragging on really slowly, and, like, recess is still not here. Are you guys on summer break yet? Yeah, so you're, like, unstuck. So has anyone ever seen one of these? This is called... A finger trap, yes. So if you put it in, my fingers are stuck. So I want to tell you, I want to tell you, you know what? Miss, guess what? Guess what, guys? Miss Danny has one for each of you. You're welcome, parents. Uh, <laughs> that you will get in Sunday school later. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story while my fingers are stuck. And then you guys will get one of these at Sunday school, okay? So uh, in the book of Acts, uh, it was a hard time to be a Christian, to, to be a follower of Jesus. Um, some people were getting thrown in prison, like Peter, who was one of Jesus' disciples. Uh, King Herod threw him into prison, and uh, Peter found himself uh, with guard Reuben and guard Naomi on either side of him, and he was chained up, and he was like, I am stuck. All right, oh, Naomi and Reuben are not going to, they're not going to let me go. Because they're, no, Na like Naomi that. would, okay, thank you, Naomi. Um, so, <laughs> he's, Reuben is not going to let me go. Um, and then Peter thought he was asleep. He thought he was dreaming, and he felt this nudging in his side. He 
He's like, what is that? And someone said, Peter, get up. And he looked, and he wasn't chained up anymore, and the guards were asleep. And he walked up, and the door to the prison was open, and he walked out all the way to his house, and his friends were there. They were praying for him, and they said, Peter's here. And they said, there's no way Peter's here, the, the woman who answered the door. And Peter was there. It wasn't a dream. An angel had helped him be unstuck. So we're going we're gonna to pray, um, and we thank God. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Gracious God, we thank you that we can trust you even when we feel stuck. And we thank you for these amazing stories, uh, like the story of Peter being unstuck from prison. Uh, We thank you that you are with us, even in the moments where we feel the most stuck, um, and that uh, you are the one who journeys with us and sits with us in our moments of stuckness and who leads us uh, to, uh, to new paths and to open doors. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys are dismissed to Sunday school. So uh, we live in an age uh, where it's easy to be sort of non-committal. I know I feel that. You kind of half in, half out, or in when it's easy or convenient, or you get something out of it, um, and out when it's difficult or frustrating or challenging. Um, Christ challenges us to let our yes be yes and our no be no. Uh, So it is an inspiring thing to me every year when we do this to to see a new class of elders and deacons who are committing to these offices, uh, whose words and vows today will mean something uh, as they vow to serve their Lord uh, and his church in this way. And I want to invite our new class of elders and deacons to come up here and join me now. We are all called into the Church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. And let's spread on both sides of the stage. There we go. Brett wants to make sure he gets all of you in the, in the shot. This is our common calling, uh, to be disciples and servants of our Lord. Within the community of the church, some are called to particular service as deacons, as elders, and as ministers of word and sacram- sacrament. Uh, Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us, providing for ministries of caring and compassion in the world, the deacons, ordering the leadership and guidance of the church, the elders, and the preaching the word and administering the sacraments. So at this time, the the session of Central Kitsap Presbyterian Church now ordains Mary Iyer and Kathy Green to the office of deacon, and Ben Brzezicki. Larry Iyer and David Sweeney to the office of elder and installs them to active service on their respective boards. The session also installs to active service those who have been previously ordained, deacons uh, Lynn Meads and Gary Spees and elder Margaret Campbell. So here's those questions we've talked about for a few weeks now. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, Acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If so, would you say, I do? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? If so, would you say, I do? do. In baptism, I'm sorry, separate one. That's for new members. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? If so, would you say, I do and I will? Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? If so, would you say, I will? Will you be governed by our church's polity, and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, would you say, I will? Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? If so, would you say, I will? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? If so, would you say, I do? do. Will you seek to serve the people with energy, 
intelligence, imagination, and love? If so, would you say, I will? And to our deacons, will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, would you say, I will? And to our elders, will you be a faithful elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in the councils of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, would you say, I will? will. To the congregation, do we, the members of the church, accept these individuals as our deacons and elders, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? If so, would you say, we do? We do. Do we agree to pray for them, encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? If so, would you say, we do? For those who are ordained and installed, I'm going to invite you to find your way down one of these three aisles, and I'm going to invite the congregation to circle around and lay hands on our new elders and deacons, so we can, a few of you want to go down that aisle and a few down this. And congregation, you're invited to stand and lay hands on your elders and deacons. Friends, let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your steadfast faithfulness to us. In every age, you have called forth leaders, both obvious and unlikely, to serve you, and you equipped them with your gifts. Among your people, Israel, you anointed prophets, priests, rulers. You called pastors and teachers, elders and deacons to build up your church. For your servants in every age, O God, and for the church of Jesus Christ, we give you all thanks and praise. God of grace, pour out your Holy Spirit on these elders and deacons, that they may faithfully, wisely, and compassionately serve this church. Give them openness to the Holy Spirit's leading, that they may see and serve wherever there is need. In everything, give them the mind of Christ, who did not grasp at greatness, but emptied himself to become a servant of all. Give them joy in their walk of faith and a sure sense of your abiding presence for their work of ministry. Amen. Let's welcome our new group of elders and deacons. And you may be seated.
I may have uh, shared this before, uh, but I think it's so extraordinary that some of the very last words of Martin Luther King Jr. were him requesting this song. His, uh, his accompanist, they were doing a, planning a prayer meeting that night, and he leaned over the balcony of the hotel, and he said, you've got to play Precious Lord, Take My Hand tonight. And the accompanist said, sure, we'll do that. He said, no, you, you have to play it tonight. Uh, and just moments later, King was, uh, was assassinated, uh, so that almost as if there was something, uh, the Holy Spirit orchestrating something, but I'm tired, I'm weak, I'm worn. Precious Lord, take my hand. So we've got this week in our Daniel sermon series, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's a story uh, that uh, will be familiar to many of us from flannel graphs and from camp songs and from talking vegetables. Uh, This has been the subject of Sunday school lessons the world over, and in one sense, understandably so, it's a memorable and compelling story. Uh, But I sometimes wonder if we do miss some of the terror and the drama of the story, just like we miss the terror and the drama of something like Noah's Ark, when we turn them into kids' cartoons. Uh, As we've alluded to throughout the series, uh, this story may have been composed in the time of Daniel in the courts of Babylon, and it might have been composed centuries later while Jews were under the oppressive, tyrannical hand of Antiochus Epiphanes. So lest we get overly nostalgic for this story, let's set some context. Uh, The book of Jeremiah speaks of two prophets of Israel, Zedekiah and Ahab, being burned alive by Nebuchadnezzar. And the book of 2 Maccabees, chapter 7, recounts a gruesome scene perpetrated by Antiochus Epiphanes against the Jews. It says, the king fell into a rage and gave orders to have pans and cauldrons heated, and he commanded that the tongue of their spokesman be cut out, and they scalp him and cut off his hands and feet while the rest of his brothers and the mother looked on. When he was utterly helpless, the king ordered them to take him into the fire, still breathing, and to fry him in a pan. The smoke from the pan spread widely, but the brothers and their mother encouraged one another to die nobly, saying, the Lord God is watching over us and in truth has compassion on us. If we imagine this chapter composed with something like that as the background, the tenor changes from a happy camp song to something with much darker undertones. Now, there is comedy to this story. And one of the comedic elements, I think, is the repetition that you'll see of the chief administrators, the ministers, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the provincial officials to assemble. And I'm not going to read all of those out each time for the sake of just length when we read the text, but they're repeated three times, the whole litany. It's like a clown car unloading. You can just imagine this story being told in oral tradition. Also repeated four times in our text today is this. When you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the zither, the lyre, the the harp, the flute, and every kind of instrument, and this begs an important theological question, which is what on earth is a zither? It has an almost comical feel of mockery toward the Babylonian bureaucracy or, or, or the pompousness of the whole operation. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, we'll see, he acts wild and irrational compared with the calmness of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So one way this story might be read, from the way it has been written down and and is being told to us, is something maybe a little bit akin to the Br'er Rabbit stories, which were told in slave communities in the American South. Uh, The most famous of those, you probably know it, is of the Tar Baby, wherein Br'er Fox traps Br'er Rabbit by putting out a figure that's made of tar, which Br'er Rabbit gets stuck in, uh, stuck to when the figure doesn't respond to his polite greetings and he strikes it in anger. But Br'er Rabbit, you probably know the story, he manages to escape outsmarting the fox by begging him to please skin me or roast me or hang me, but please don't throw me into the briar patch. Which, of course, the fox does, wanting to inflict the most pain, not realizing that he's been tricked and that rabbits live in briar patches. So a lot has been written about this. Um, There's comedy to the story, but undertones of deep suffering. Tar Baby uh, has been used as a racial slur, but in the original context of the slave story, it has to do with a sticky situation that gets worse the more you tangle with it. Br'er Rabbit in these stories is always the underdog who's able to cleverly outsmart the more powerful but dim-witted Br'er Fox and Br'er Bear, 
representatives of slave masters. Uh, Frederick Douglass, in his uh, biography, wrote about a tactic that his uh, plantation owner and presumably others used. Um, he painted a fence around his garden with tar to keep slaves out. Uh, slaves who were discovered with tar on them, which is notoriously hard to get off, were brutally beaten and whipped. So there's laughter and there's comedy in stories like Br'er Rabbit and in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but, but it's the laughter of someone or of a people who have learned to laugh in the face of profound suffering. Let's pray as we come together to God's Word this morning. Gracious God, we thank you for this story that has spoken to your people for so many years, in so many places, in so many trials. We thank you that we get to read this story today as your people, and we ask that it would speak. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Friends, I'll invite you as you're able to stand for the reading of God's Word this morning. The book of Daniel, chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue. It was 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. It, he set it up in the Dura Valley in the province of Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar then ordered the chief administrators, the ministers, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the provincial officials to assemble and come for the dedication of the statue he had set up. So they assembled for the dedication of the statue. The herald proclaimed loudly, peoples, nations, and languages, this is what you must do when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the flute, and every kind of instrument, you must bow down and worship the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Anyone who will not bow down and worship will be immediately thrown into a furnace of flaming fire. So because of this order, as soon as they heard the sound of the instruments, all the peoples bowed down and worshiped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At that moment, some Chaldeans came forward, seizing a chance to attack the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. There are some Jews, ones you appointed to administer the province of Babylon, specifically Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who have ignored your command. They don't serve your gods, and they, won't, they don't worship the gold statue you've set up. In a violent rage, Nebuchadnezzar ordered them to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is it true that you don't serve my gods or worship the gold statue I've set up? If you are now ready to do so, bow down and worship the gold statue I've made. But if you don't worship it, you will be thrown straight into the furnace of flaming fire. Then what god will rescue you from, your, from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to answer your question. If our god... The one we serve is able to rescue us from the furnace of flaming fire and from your power, your majesty, then let him rescue us. But if he doesn't, know this for certain. Your majesty, we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you've set up. Nebuchadnezzar was filled with rage and his face twisted beyond recognition because of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In response, he commanded that the furnace be heated to seven times its normal heat. He told some of the strongest men in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the furnace of flaming fire. So they were bound, still dressed in all their clothes, and thrown into the furnace of flaming fire. The furnace was heated to such an extreme that the fire's flame killed the very men who, car uh, killed the very men who carried Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to it. So these three men fell bound into the furnace of flaming fire. Then ne King Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in shock and said to his associates, didn't we throw three men bound into the fire? They answered the king, certainly, your majesty. He rep replied, look, I see four men unbound walking around inside the fire, and they aren't hurt. And the fourth one looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar went near the opening of the furnace of flaming fire and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. Then they came out of the fire. Nebuchadnezzar declared, May the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be praised. He sent his messenger to rescue his servants who trusted him. They ignored the king's order, sacrificing their bodies because they wouldn't serve or worship any god but their god. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. You may be finally seated in the presence of God in the company of saints. 
So Nebuchadnezzar missed the point of the dream that he dreamt in chapter 2, which Daniel interpreted. Uh, Apparently, Nebuchadnezzar didn't listen to my sermon last week. Rather than a warning, he sees his dream about a giant statue of himself as an invitation. So he builds one in the Dura Valley and throws a lavish party to celebrate its dedication. All the important people are there, all the best musicians, and it's for a great cause. It will unify the people. When you hear the Babylonian hymn or the Babylonian national anthem played, religion and state aren't easily separated in the ancient world, you better bow down. Something grand, something spectacular, something awe-inspiring, a giant gold statue accompanied by a stirring song and throngs of people all bowing together for a common cause. Just moves your heart, doesn't it? And if awe-inspiring doesn't bring about obedience, then threat will do it. Death to all who don't comply. But who wouldn't want to comply? It's for a good cause, Babylonian patriotism. And the statue is magnificent. And did you hear that woman playing the zither? She is the best zitherist I have ever heard. And besides the comical effect of repeating these lists of officials in all these instruments, one of the effects of listing them out over and over again is to heighten the sense that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are all alone in this ordeal. It's not just the threat of Nebuchadnezzar that's hanging over their heads. The whole culture, the smartest people in all of Babylon are all pushing one direction, celebrating how great this is. Mike Cosper said this in a recent podcast. There's a popular internet meme that goes around where there's a crowd of Germans in a shipyard giving the Nazi salute and one guy slightly turned away who refuses. The caption usually says something like, when the time comes, be this guy. We'd all like to think we're that guy. That we'd be immune to the excitement of the crowd, the aura of charisma, the sense of movement that mobilizes masses of people. But there's a reason he's alone in that picture. You have to know there's something wrong. You have to know there's something wrong when your senses and the voices around you and everything life's already taught you about where to put your faith and trust is pushing the other way. I hope we might have the backbone to be that guy, but I also hope we have the fear and trembling necessary to know We might not be. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego face huge backlash for their resistance. When the music is playing, when all the people in power and the wave of society are going one way, there's a cost in pushing against that. Now, I think it needs to be said at the same time that there are good reasons and there are bad reasons to push against authority. Uh, Being anti-authoritarian doesn't always mean anything, really. Uh, My toddler screams when we offer him vegetables. It it doesn't mean he's being courageous uh, in his anti-authoritarianism. Remember from the first sermon in this series, the question that's asked of us, what is eroding your baptismal identity? What What is demanding allegiances and even subtly supplanting your faith? The book of Daniel is exploring how do you live in an empire and stick to who you are in Christ. Last week, we, last week we saw that Daniel went by his Babylonian name, Belteshazzar. And this week, his friends are apparently going by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They apparently were okay accepting their Babylonian names. When the river, the current of the culture or of government authority or of workplace expectations is pushing subtly or not so subtly in a certain direction, how do you know when to swim against it? How do you know which current to swim against? Daniel drew a line in eating certain foods. And this is a line that we see these three men draw. They won't bow down to this statue. I think as people of faith, our criteria about when to make a stand must be related to this. Am I being asked to do something that negates the glory, the justice, the mercy of God? Maybe that's related to bowing down or submitting to a certain symbol. Maybe it's taking a stand on on something because of how certain people are being treated. We so often want to make this about ourselves and our own brave stand. Because Americans, on the left and the right, we, we have almost made an idol of going against the grain. How many Disney movies are about someone throwing off the traditions and expectations of their parents? How many clothing ads are all about being uniquely you, ironically making you more like everybody else, but marketers know what they're doing? 
Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego aren't refusing Nebuchadnezzar's demands in order to maintain their God-given individuality or autonomy to prove that no one can tell us what to do. They're doing it because they're a witness to a kingdom beyond Babylon. And their allegiance is to a king greater than Nebuchadnezzar. Now, here's a distinction that I think is well worth making. Not bowing to a 60-foot golden statue in the Dura Valley and being faced with the threat of burning alive is a very dramatic example of taking a stand. But here's what I want to really draw out here. For most of us, the choices will not be so dramatic. And for most of us, the cost of taking a stand is not always going to be quite that high. Now, maybe our reputation, our career, or our relationships will take a hit because of our refusal to do something we think goes against God's will. Maybe our business will take a hit because we refuse to stoop to unethical practices that all our competitors are doing. I mean, there are real costs. But few of us will be faced with the threat of death, with a fiery furnace, And as I said in week one, when we talk about empire, it's not just nation states. It's it's not just government regulations. There are other empires at work on us. Here's our unique challenge. Fleming Rutledge writes, sometimes I wonder if American culture might not be even more seductive than King Nebuchadnezzar's realm. After all, it was clear to the young Hebrews that Babylon really was pagan, When King Nebuchadnezzar erected an image of gold in the province of Babylon, there could have been no doubt in the minds of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego whether it was really the most high God wrapped in a Babylonian flag. It wasn't. It was an idol, pure and simple. In American society today, today, no one is going to do anything so crass as to set an idol before you and say, worship this. But for the most part, the idols are going to be masquerading as good things in life which are compatible with the Christian faith. You can have God, and you can have all these other things too. You can pursue whatever life is most pleasing and enjoyable as long as you practice personal piety. Sometimes it seems we should be asking whether the whole Christian community in America hasn't fallen prey to the gospel of prosperity, the gospel of success, the gospel of happiness, the gospel of Mesopotamia first. So if we move away from the dramatic examples of taking a stand against the government or against the culture, though those certainly have their place in time, here are some of the Nebuchadnezzar statues I think we face. And these aren't all mine. It's a list I've sort of integrated from a few different sources. We may not face the crass example of here's an idol, but we will be faced with things like this. We will be tempted to believe that the end justifies the means in a hundred areas ranging from personal relationships to professional choices to political commitments. We will be tempted to take the line of least resistance in raising our children. We will be tempted to only commit to someone or something when we get something out of it, when it benefits us. We will be tempted to a purely individualistic view of the Christian faith that concentrates exclusively on the state of one's own soul without any reference to the needs of society as a whole, and particularly the the oppressed within society. We will be tempted to believe it doesn't matter much which God or golden statue we bow down to in worship so long as we are sincere or being true to ourselves in that worship. We're going to be tempted to think of prayer as a technique for manipulating God or of being a Christian as a path to the good life. We will be tempted to set aside our faith because it's seen as archaic, outmoded, retrograde, exclusive, judgmental, or just doesn't fit into our schedule. We will be tempted to always be doing listening to noise, binging, watching, working, and never sitting in silence to reflect and to pray. We will be tempted to avoid regularly doing things, important things, difficult things for which we will never be thanked or noticed. We will be tempted to avoid regularly, regularly doing things, important things, difficult things for which we will even be opposed or disparaged. We will be tempted to only be friends with people who think like us and to dismiss others as judgmental or narrow-minded, who don't affirm us in every decision or lifestyle choice we make. We will be tempted to dismiss someone outright for their actions or their opinions rather than wondering what God might still do in their life, even if right now it's falling apart. There are all sorts of subtle ways and places throughout our week where we are called to take a stand. 
And it often won't be the drama that you can post about on social media to show how courageous you're being. Here's one more empire we all find ourselves from time to time in service to, the empire of ourselves. We set up a massive statue in our minds of who we're supposed to be, how others are supposed to see us, and we try to get everything in us to bow down to that image. We want to be seen as the smartest person in the room, as the, the life of the party. We want to be seen as the mom who has it all together with her kids. We, we want to be seen as the dependable person who has all, always has all the details worked out. And when we fail to live up to that image, we become a terrible Nebuchadnezzar to ourselves, a murderous tyrant in our self-criticism. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's words are extraordinary. Um, they are not as concise as Queen Esther's in exile as she prepares to take a stand before the king and says the words, if I perish, I perish. But they are just as memorable. If our God, the one we serve, is able to rescue us from the furnace of flaming fire and from your power, your majesty, then let him rescue us. Our God is able. But if not, if he doesn't, know this for certain, your majesty, we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you've set up. If he rescues us, we won't bow down. But if he doesn't rescue us, we won't bow down. That's a catch-22 for Nebuchadnezzar, I guess. And it's theologically rich. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego don't worship God because they have something to get out of it. They worship God because of who God is. It's funny how we see this as a problematic thing in our human relationships, even if we still do it. Like, I'm going to befriend this person so that she can get my child into that school or so I can get this job, using a person as a means to an end. We so often do this with God. And then when God doesn't deliver us from the fiery furnace, we get really angry. What, what kind of God is this? So maybe we were worshiping an idol all along rather than the living God. Because the living God, the crucified God, doesn't often do what we want God to do. Fleming Rutledge again writes, This is not the familiar evangelistic technique of winning souls by recounting one tale after another of prayer requests answered. God is God whether he chooses to intervene on the human stage in a particular way or not. His majesty, his righteousness, his worthiness to be worshipped does not depend on any given set of conditions that human beings might devise. The three young men believed that it was infinitely better to die praising the living God than it was to compromise his honor by acting as though he were no better than Nebuchadnezzar's image, a God bound to and limited by the needs and demands of his followers, a God who would be at the beck and call of all those who claimed to worship him. I mean, we do this all the time. God, God wouldn't ask me to do this difficult thing or, or, or this uncomfortable thing. I have a hard time with a God that would say that or do that. Just this week, I read someone's commentary, a biblical scholar no less, on Daniel 7, uh, which, as you'll see in a few weeks, is a description of some representative of God coming with kingly power. And the scholar said, this text does not match well with my experience of God. Even more, I find it rather unsuitable for Jesus, who seems to have openly rejected the title of king. Apparently, this individual didn't study what Messiah or son of David or even son of man, which Jesus applied to himself, meant in the Jewish tradition. But we do this all the time. We impose our set of conditions on God. If God does this for me, then God will be worthy of my worship, of my time, of my energy, of my resources. For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God is worthy of their worship because of who God is, not because of how God will get them what they want. So, they are cast into the fire. Nebuchadnezzar realizes the limit of his power. Uh, this week, Ty and I went to a Seattle Presbytery meeting, and one of the candidates who was being examined for ordination had this lovely little line in her statement of faith. She said, Christ's death and resurrection demonstrate the full expression of God's love and expose evil's lack of ultimacy. Evil does not have ultimate power. Evil is not an ultimate thing. It can only be a parasite, a corruption of the good. Nebuchadnezzar does not have ultimate power. Nebuchadnezzar can kill these young men, but for all his power, he cannot make them do what he wants them to do. He can kill them, but he can't make them bow down and worship. And he's hot with rage because he sees the limits of his vast power, and maybe he senses somewhere that these young men will haunt his already haunted dreams. 
As Jesus says in Matthew's gospel, don't be afraid of those who kill the body but can't kill the soul. Instead, be afraid of the one who can destroy, destroy both body and soul in hell. The worst that Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, the worst that Caesar and Pontius Pilate of Rome could do was kill the body. The furnace is heated so hot that, that those who throw the young men in are killed themselves in the process. And John Golden Gay insightfully comments here, tormentors often experience the very torment they had planned. How true this is. We see this in dramatic examples of the tortured life that torturers often go on to live or murderers. But we've surely all seen it in our own lives too when we've held on to grudges, refused to forgive, thinking that in, in doing so we're tormenting the person who wronged us, failing to realize that we're mostly just tormenting ourselves. It's the Babylonians who are burned and their attempt to burn these young men. So let's turn back to this theme of suffering. Now the text again pertains to those who suffered because they took a stand. And I hope we keep that in view. Their suffering is directly related to their costly witness. But let's set even that aside right now and just speak of suffering more broadly. Because there are many in this place today who are in the midst of some fiery trial. The furnace you are in right now may be an illness that you are battling. Constant pain, constant pokes and jabs, constant discomfort, constant sleepless nights. The furnace you are in may be caring for someone you love. Someone who is making destructive decisions or someone who is just battling a cruel disease and you find yourself juggling the exhaustion of the endless demands, the grief of watching someone who once was so strong wither away, the guilt you may be feeling for feeling angry sometimes that they're demanding every ounce of your energy and time. The furnace you are in may be a workplace that is hostile or toxic, and you can feel your body physically reacting, simply driving closer to it at work, a tightening, a panic, a feeling like a shell of yourself. Maybe you're in a furnace of grief. It feels like everything you love, every happy or joyful moment has been burned away in this unquenchable fire of loss. Here's what I find so extraordinary about this story. In the face of suffering, many people do have the reaction of, of throwing off God because they had, they had maybe actually made an idol. They had worshipped a God of their own creation, a God who's supposed to not let bad things happen to them, who's supposed to get them out of jams, who's supposed to meet their set of conditions for a happy life. It's easy to do. We all do it from time to time. But many people have an experience like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They are miraculously rescued? No, that's not quite what I mean. If we take Psalms like 139 at face value, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I, if I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I go down to the depths, you are there. If I go to the far ends of the sea, even there, you are with me. If we take words like Jesus' words after his resurrection, behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, then we can say with reasonable confidence that God is with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego always, and with us always. We can say that God is with them in Nebuchadnezzar's court when they make their courageous proclamation. But even if these young men knew it, they don't see it. They're acting on faith. They're certain of what they hope for, sure of things unseen. So when does God tangibly, most powerfully, most visibly manifest to them? In the crucible of suffering, in the furnace. God has always been with them, but it's when the situation is most dire, most desperate, that they actually see God. And many of you here know the truth of this. You have encountered God most powerfully, most personally, in your moments of deepest, most extraordinary pain, of grief, of desperation, of dead ends. Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego couldn't yet have known this, but we know it. Is there any surprise, knowing that the God we worship is a crucified God, is there any surprise to us that the place they would encounter this God most visibly and tangibly is the place of their most profound suffering at the very, very, very end of the line? And consider this. 
It's in the very place that Nebuchadnezzar was using to fuel his own glory, to build his statue, the place he was using as a weapon to destroy those who would threaten his glory. It's there that the glory of God is revealed. It is Yahweh of Israel, not Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, whose true power and glory is shown in the fires of that furnace. Just as it is Jesus of Nazareth, not Caesar of Rome, whose true power and glory is shown on that cross. This is who God is. The God whose glory transcends the places of deepest darkness and hopelessness. This is who God is. This God who this God is, in and of God's very self, this God is worthy of worship, not because of God's willingness to meet our little sets of conditions on what stance God should take on whatever issue we're passionate about or how God should do away with our suffering. This is the God who is with us always and can often be seen most visibly in fiery furnaces and Golgotha crosses, most visibly seen in your moments of deepest pain and exhaustion, and dead ends, and fear, and suffering, and trials. This is the God for whom Isaiah the prophet spoke. And perhaps these words were themselves spoken in Babylon, not far from the Dura Valley, when he said this, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He doesn't grow tired or weary. His understanding no one can fathom, giving strength to the weak and reviving the exhausted. And now, says the Lord, the one who created you, the one who formed you, do not fear, for I am with you. I have called you by name. You are mine. I will strengthen you. I will surely help you. I will hold you with my righteous right hand. All who rage against you will be shamed and disgraced. Those who contend with you will be as nothing and will perish. You will look for your opponents and you won't find them. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When through the rivers, they won't sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you won't be scorched and the flames won't burn you. I am the Lord your God who takes you by the hand, who says to you, do not fear. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you were the one who takes us by the hand, calls us by name, never leaves us, never forsakes us. Not even, but especially in the places of fiery trials. Help us in those places to see you and see your glory. Help us to take a stand for who you are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand? When the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in and When I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me, there was another in the waters, holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears a burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. Slave 
by Marjorie Maddox. His face is the greater flame, but doesn't flicker. No furnace fuels his glory. Son of gods, the king calls out and cowers from the heat. Sparks crown our heads. We are unsinged and sing of seraphs, genuflect before his servant, ten times as golden as any man-made Hades that can't consume the luminous, the purified, the once upon a time burning bush, that evermore ignited blaze of Yahweh. Friends, receive now the benediction. The Lord your God is with you, and he's mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Go in peace. Amen.